and welcome to the Mindful Making video podcast. This is episode number 32. And if you are into yarn and into making and into knitting in particular, you have landed in just the right spot. So for the next half hour, I will talk to you about what I've been knitting lately and what my plans are for the future of knitting wise. And then I will also um, take you back and tell a story of, or tell this story of how we as a Danish family landed in Sydney nine and a half years ago or nine years ago. So that's what is installed for you today. So grab your project, have a cup of tea, coffee, wine, whatever you fancy and um, sit back, relax and just enjoy a bit of um, hand making and, and um, knitting with me. So um, let's get started. Today it is Sunday the 3rd of September. It is Father's Day here in Australia. So I'm sending, sending from Hornsby Heights, which is a suburb north of Sydney in Australia. It's Father's Day, as I said. Um, we usually do not celebrate those days in particular, but of course my husband thinks that Father's Day is the most important day of, of all days in the year. So um, we've been out for a nice walk this morning and then we have ordered sushi for tonight. So that is our celebration of Father's Day. The situation here in uh, Australia is that we are moving into um, week 12 of lockdown. So uh, nothing much is happening, but I will insert a few snippets of spring flowers that I see when I'm out walking each day. So they will just be sprinkled across um, or over this throughout this video. So yes, it is spring in Australia and I know that a lot of you are watching from the States or from Europe and Denmark in particular and I know that you are moving into autumn but we are moving into spring so um, we can feel that the temperatures are, are rising so a typical day is a, around 20 degrees the sun is warming and and you know everything is just blooming and the scents and the smells are just amazing so we can still, of course, even though we're in lockdown, we can we can walk around our neighborhood. So that's what I've done. And uh, basically, you know, what happens for us is a trip to the post office or grocery shopping. That's it, basically. But this time will pass as well. Let's move into the knitting content. And let me start with what I'm wearing. And that is also my finished object for this episode. This is the Kuta Pullover and it's designed by Sari Norlund. She is a Finnish designer, have a lot of beautiful patterns in her rivalry store. And um, it has this beautiful lace work um, in the round yoke. And, and then splitting for sleeves and then a straight body down. I have worked this in um, Super Soft, which from Holzgarn, and this yarn is a 100% wool. Um, it is, the color is beautifully, sort of a mix of green, yellow, brown, gray. So it's, it's, it's quite difficult to describe. Maybe it's sort of a dark brass color. And as you can see, these, uh, this patterning is repeated at the, the cuffs. Um, yeah, so I'm um, very, very happy with, uh, with this project. This is what I have left of a... Um, of five balls of 50 grams, so of 250 grams. So it's only a 200 
20 something uh, weight in this jumper. Uh, I have put up the details uh, on my Ravelry page, which is Mindful Making AU. And you can see there, I've listed the, the yarn, of course, and the modifications that I've made because there are a few. So um, the gauge with this yarn, which is um, much thinner than uh, what the, the pattern is, is made for. So the gauge is 24 stitches instead of 20 stitches per 10 centimeters. So obviously I had to go up sizes go up in sizes and i went up two sizes i think two or three so this is size number six in her pattern so i just basically looked at the um yeah finished measurements and the bust circumference and decided on which size would fit what i wanted the final result to be and then i chose that size to knit so the length, I could still work in number of centimeters. So that worked out pretty well. So the row gauge wasn't as important here. Um, the modifications that I made, well, first of all, sorry to jump around, but I had knitted this and I've split for sleeves. I've knitted the body. I've finished one sleeve before I tried it on. Maybe my advice is probably to try it on before you get that far <laughs> because I didn't like how it fitted. I didn't like the fit. So the problem was that the yoke was too deep. So it was three, four centimeters deeper than I have now. And then the sleeves were were too tight down here so so I ended up with all fabric up here around the so shoulders and under the um, the arm pit sort of in in here under the arm and then bulking up here fabric and I knew that I wouldn't be happy well so uh, the only thing to do in that case is to rip back and re-knit so I think it took an extra week just to re-knit the body and re-knit the sleeves. And what I did to the sleeves in terms of modification is that I decided to add an extra pattern repeat on the cuff here. So I've added 16 stitches. And that means that the sleeve decreases do not move or they are not decreasing as fast. So um, that means that the sleeves just falls, falls, drape, probably not. But anyway, they sit much better and they're much more harmonic. And I don't think that the uh, the cuff is too wide. Um, I really like the fit and um, I won't stand up here because that's a very awkward position, but I will insert a, a sh short little series of pictures of me wearing it outside. The color is difficult to capture in, in those photos. I think the color looks much more brown than it is in reality. So this, uh, how, how the color is represented on the screen now, I think it's very true to, to what it actually looks like. Uh, and I was a bit, is this a color for me? Is there too much yellow? But um, I like it. I like it. I like it a lot. And I do love this, you know, patterning up here in the round yoke. It's beautiful. Interesting for this jumper, the uh, the back is raised down here under under the under the sleeves or under the arms. That's the first time I've tried to do that, which makes the neckline beautiful. So you don't have this extra piece of 
stocking it sitting before the um before the uh, you know the texture starts so um point taken and noted for other uh, other jumpers to insert it here so this is what i'm wearing and the coming back to the uh, the yarn as i said it's the um super soft from Hulskan and the color is called Scarab, S-C-A-R-A-B. The thing about the super soft um, yarn is that it has a bit of spinning oil in it still. So it is a bit, it, it does feel a bit sort of um, rustic when you knit with it. But as soon as it's washed, 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 it just softens and blooms and becomes this lovely, soft, um, natural fabric. It is not as soft as a merino and, you know, silk, cashmere, all these super duper soft fibers. But it's still soft and I can wear it this next to skin. I do have a sort of camisole under it, but I can wear it next to skin. So, uh, and I just like how it regulates temperature because it's a natural wool. And then these, you know, the, the coloring is just so beautiful with a bit of gray heathered undertones. Yeah, and I, as I said, um, now I'm just looking in my notes for the stats. If anybody is interested, Puta sweater. I started the 6th of August and I finished on the 29th of August. And I have used 228 grams, so that is 1,274 meters of yarn. In this jumper. I've knitted the lace on a 3.25 millimeter needle and the body in a 3.5 millimeter. And as I said, gauge 24 stitches and I made size 6. <music> So that's, um, that's then what I'm wearing and also the finished object. So I hadn't started this jumper at the last episode. So um, this has been finished, started and finished since the last time we, um, we caught up. Another project that I have finished involved this beauty. Sadly, I can't show you yet, but it's a shawl that I've been knitting and um, more on that to come. That's it for the finished objects. I'm sure this will be a very short or maybe not. Who knows? Episode. Well, um, and then, and what is on my needles at the moment involves this yarn. 
And as you can see, it's, um, it's also a re-knit. Uh, what can I say? I think this is, that's the theme of this year, my knitting journey this year. It is unraveling, unraveling and re-knitting. This will be a cozy, roomy, generously sized, um, comfy raglan sweater that I can't show you either. I can say that the yarn is a, so this is two strand held together of a, um, this is a, the BFL nylon sock base from um, Louis and Lola and also her oh, Kit Silk Mohair. The Kit Silk Mohair is Color Sage. The, this yarn, the sock yarn, is not available at the moment in her shop. It will be later. So um, yes, Unraveled and Re-Knitting, I am almost at the hem of the body and then the sleeves is the next so that's what i'm working on at the moment but then i thought well i can't sit here <laughs> on my podcast and not and have so little to talk about so so i thought i will share some um, some of the next projects that will come um, come on my needles Last time I did show you a hank of yarn that I bought for my daughter for a pair of socks. Those will be next. So they are here, caked up in a very messy cake. The yarn is called Who Gives a Flying Flathead? Bombed yarns and it is a 7525, 75 Marina 25 nylon base. Um, she has picked out she has picked out the socks that she wants from the 52 weeks of socks. I will just find it. So here they are. She has chosen these ones and I did tell her that they might be difficult. It might be difficult to see to see this color work when using the, um, the very speckled yarn. It is the Mica socks and they are designed by Christine Vija or Beja, V-E-J-A-R. But I will try and, and, and do it with adding just a, a white color for the, that color work section. Let's see how that works. So that is, um, that is one of the next projects that would be knitted up. So hopefully I can show you the progress at the next, in the next episode. Another project that I have been wanting to knit for a very long time is a summer top and it's the Velico designed by Andrea Mari. And I will just put up a picture of it here so you can see its sort of simple and um, sort of graphic structure. Her sample here is grey, black, white but I thought I would use some of my own hand dyed yarn and um, some yarn that I dyed with avocado um, last year, I think. So actually, and literally before 
half an hour before sitting down to record this, I um, caked up the yarn and I thought it would be that it only included two colors. So these are the two colors that um, I will use. So they are um, avocado dyed on a base of coast yarn. Uh, and I thought that would be very pretty for a, a summer top using these two colors together. And then when I looked at the pattern, it um, it is for three colors. So that means I will insert the third of these, this hand dyed bundle that I did. And it is here. So these, I'll put it over here. These will be the colors. There's not just not, not much difference. The one that is not caked up yet is slightly darker than the two others. I am looking at summer knitting. I realize that my wardrobe is not very summery. So I think, or I know I need to do something about that. So I am uh, starting and planning out summer tops. If you are also moving into summer, what, which tops do you like and which tops would you need? Uh, would you need or would you knit? Or if you are, have just left summer and moving into autumn, which summer top did you really enjoy knitting? Please put your suggestions downstairs, downstairs, down under. <laughs> in the comments i would love to be inspired by your favorites um favorite summer tops t-shirts so i'll be looking forward to to flicking through that and uh, also while talking about comments thank you so much every time you leave a comment it just makes a huge difference for me um, to just getting to know you and interact with you makes it all worth it so thank you so much to those of you who have put in comments um, throughout these uh, 30 some episodes that's the knitting plans let's move into a bit of the statistics so each month i um, calculate um, how much yarn i have knitted in the last month so uh, in August I finished two objects and I used so that was a shawl and uh, the kuta jumper and I used up a total of two kilometers of yarn so two finished objects and 2014 meters. And while on uh, the stats, I've um, I've just moved the chair here in front of my little uh, my own little um, yarn collection, and um, I've added a bit more to my yarn collection, and I'm tracking it in a um, in a spreadsheet if you want if you haven't seen that you can go back to the previous episode and you can see that when i moved my yarn into this um, shelving system i just added it into a spreadsheet uh, to calculate how many meters i have or how much yarn i have in episode 31 the last one i had 69 i think kilometers of yarn and um, I knew I hadn't moved every, all the yarn up. So now I have one, more than 100 kilometers of yarn. So 100, I think 104. And I have these cones of uh, super soft yarn as well, sitting here in the, um, in the drawers. 
maybe one day I will um, sort of wind them up as well and have them sitting on the shelves, but they have now been added to my yarn collection. So plenty of yarn and probably much more than I need for my entire knitting life. But there is something really, really nice in just having, you know, well, this, sound, this sounds odd, but having your loved ones around you. I talked to my sister-in-law the other day. We, um, we walked together, so we had the screen going uh, over a sort of messenger, call over messenger. Did I tell you this last time? If I did, sorry. If I didn't, it's a good story. Um, so, so you know, we walk together and she walks in Denmark, I walk here and we can see each other and chat and show sort of where we walk. And we were just talking about this, about all this yarn that I have. But she said, well, it's a feel good. It's a feel good feeling. It gives that, yeah, <laughs> and sense of security as well. And she said she had her thing was having a sort of baked homemade rolls in the freezer so she could always you know take up pull, pull out a um, bag of rolls and have it ready so so that made her sort of that sense of security it could be a filled filled up fridge and um, for me it's just sort of having all my yarn a bit crazy lady but anyway that's it for the Yarny content. No, I remember just now that I still have my crochet blanket. It has progressed a bit since the last episode. I have worked on this blanket for years and it will probably be in years of podcast episodes to come, but I have done a bit now it's just trying to find where I am so this is where I am I'm almost about to add a new black stripe so here is the marker from last time can you see it there it is so I have worked sort of eight, 10 centimeters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 rows. Let me see up there. So it does progress. Steady and slowly. I see there is coffee stains on it. Progressing nicely, the, uh, the, the family is cheering me on. They want it finished. It's nice and big, massively big, and it is getting heavy. It's probably 500 grams at the moment, totally. Yeah, nice, like it. So that is just some, a, few a few minutes or half an hour or a row once in a while and it, eventually it will be done This is it for the Yarny content. Now I thought um, I would just answer a question that I had received a few times and what I've, uh, I've promised to talk about and that's uh, the story of uh, how we landed here in Australia, a Danish family. So I will just bring up my knitting and we could have a sit and knit section. Around two thousand in two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten, 
um, I guess started all of, of, of this this journey. So my husband uh, is an academic researcher. He worked at uh, Copenhagen University. He works with chemical structures of uh, drug compounds and does some molecular modeling using IT and very um, very niche and very specialized research. And um, he has had a typical academic career with, you know, PhDs and postdocs, etc. So the next step for him was a permanent position. But you know, when you're in a, a specialized field, there is not that many uh, positions that becomes available. And during that time, uh, 2009, 2010-ish, it was sort of a bit of recession. So there wasn't a much of a flow, neither in the academic world or in the biotech and pharmaceutical world. So he basically spent two years trying to, you know, to look for uh, new positions, you know, to have a job basically for when when the grant money ran out. So uh, he looked he looked around the world, uh, Sweden, the States, Germany, and I sort of I stopped engaging <laughs> engaging. At a time point, we lived. We had, you know, I was, I was settled and well, and hadn't any ambition of going anywhere. We had, uh, we lived in our house for ten years. Our kids, three kids, were all in school. Uh, so I've stopped um, engaging in the in the places or the geography he he found. But then one day he uh, he saw that there were a position available at um, the University of Sydney. So he said, well, what do you think? Should I apply? And I said, well, it's far away, but Australia isn't the worst place to move to should that happen. But, you know, you have to be in it to win it. So um, he pressed send and yes, he was called for an interview. So the first interview was Skype. And then in January 2012, he traveled out here to Sydney for the interview uh, and then got the job. So in early February 2012, we gathered the family, so three children at the time, 13, 10 and 7. <laughs> so, so we sat them down around the coffee table and said, uh, come on out, we will have a, a sort of afternoon, afternoon tea, there is cake. And they sat around and then we told them uh, that uh, their dad has got a new job. It is at the other side of the world and that we will be moving. Well, my daughter, she was 10, she didn't like the idea at all. My oldest son, he said, oh, oh, that's, that, that will be, uh, that's exciting. I'm good at making new friends, he said. And the little one of seven, he didn't understand anything. He, well, he did, he, he cried. The, his first reaction was crying. He said, I don't want to go in an, um, uh, go in an English school. I don't want to, oh. So, so it was a bit of a, um, a shock for them and of course our family as well they um and for us for that matter so on the monday the kids decided that they wanted to tell their friends in their in school that we were moving and um oh well i'm very proud of them that they did that because that's not easy and the, the funny story is that my youngest, he was in, in kindergarten at the time. And, you know, they sat in the circle and sort of talked about what has happened um, in the weekend that just passed. And, you know, they said, oh, I went to the playground. I was out playing football. We had visited, we, um, my grandparent visited. And then Aska said, oh, I'm moving to Australia. And then just the next one in, in the line just said, oh, blah, 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 blah. So it was just, it was just, oh, okay. Oh, 
group of, but of course they didn't know what um, what that entailed. Then it was the process of applying for for visa and um, putting up our house for sale. And we then we sold our home, got the visa, packaged up our house in a large container and just had our belongings in eight suitcases and uh, left our home. None of us had been to Australia before. I hadn't been here before. My husband had only gone when he went for the interviews. So we didn't know what we were moving into or out to. It was hard saying goodbye to family and friends. We didn't know when we would see them again. Um, I remember my husband's parents standing in the doorway and waving goodbye when we drove off, just waving. Ah, oh, that was tough. Um, but anyway, our our life was sort of um, our well one way tickets eleventh of July two thousand and twelve. So that was sort of our end point. We, we didn't know what was after that. The, the flight was sort of, we, we prepared everything for that date that we would be, you know, be in the airport and just, yeah, lift off and um, move around the world. Our daughter thought that it was all a dream or a nightmare. It would all stop even when we were in the airport. She didn't like it at all. But uh, moving here, landed, um, we had rented a furnished house because we did. We just had our eight suitcases and we would wait. It would take eight weeks for our furniture to arrive. Um, so we have rented a furnished house and then it was all about um, the process of settling in. The most important thing, what we tried to do first was to find some soccer for our oldest boy, 13. And then the next thing was to find schools. We landed in a city or a suburb called Gordon, which is also north of Sydney, a beautiful leafy um, suburb. And uh, the the house that we rented was just around the corner from a, the uh, the local public school. So we, um, we enrolled the two youngest, so my daughter and the youngest child, Asker, uh, in that public school. Uh, we had the first two weeks off as a holiday, as a family, and then my husband started working. And uh, we uh, tried to figure out what was uh, yeah up and down and <laughs> Anything, everything is just new, even the sounds, the smells, everything. Um, I think when you meet people who have moved from another country, think of the massive shift it is for them and just acknowledge that sometimes it isn't, it isn't easy and they may not know and help and appreciate what they bring and I think that is what I experienced because I hadn't, uh, I didn't have any uh, work when first arriving. So I looked for 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 jobs, um, both before we left, but I didn't succeed in 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 interviewing. Ah, uh, maybe interviewed a few times, but when we we're here, I started looking, um, ser you know, more seriously. And then, but I prioritized to help the kids for the first, you know, the three months, first three months for them to settle in their, into their schools. And those three months was the, uh, the best investment I've ever, ever done in terms of settling the family and also getting to know um, other parents, because that was where the connections were made. And we still have some of our close friends from from that time, so we we you know walk to school and um, uh, no sorry this is a long story, but anyway the first day at school we have been here for two weeks 
my oldest daughter, she was in year three, so she had in Denmark, so she had learned some had learned some English in in her school in Denmark, so she could speak a few words, but my youngest he couldn't do anything. He couldn't speak. He, he you know, he could say a few words like um car and yes and no and traffic lights and um well I've probably talked about this before. So when I um I walked to school and uh, you know and met the um, the principal and then I thought I could just to uh, you know join them in the classroom just to help but no 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 it was just bye bye mum see you at three oh I was just thinking how how would he survive the little one when he didn't understand anything um. But of course, you know, kids learn so quickly. So two and a half months later, he had a nice conversation with friends. Uh, they slotted right in. So uh, amazing, amazing kids. Uh, but these, the, coming back to when I was in um, uh, these first three months, so, you know, dropping off the kids to school in the morning and then picking up in the afternoon. So parents would just stand around in the schoolyard waiting for all the kids to um, get out and, and for picking up. And that's where I met uh, beautiful families that we still um, are very good friends with. So a lot of those mums are in the, uh, the book club that I'm in. Here we wear school uniforms. That was new for us. Uh, that's not what we do in Denmark. And uh, my oldest son, his biggest worry was whether he could have more than one shirt, you know, 13 and uh, yeah. But all well, all well, they have settled in so well. Um, and now the youngest has been here more, you know, he has spent more of his life here in Australia than he had in Denmark. Um, they, we speak Danish at home. So they speak and understand Danish very well. Um, they can read, but it's slow, especially for the youngest one, because he had, he had only learned to read, just learned to read when we moved. Um, much more difficult for him to write Danish. Um, our oldest son is now back in Denmark, so, uh, so he picks it up very quickly. But anyway, that's that's what uh, made us move to Australia. It's, it's um, my husband's work, so he is now uh, at University of Sydney. I've been there for yeah the nine years, and I uh, then you know looked for for a job. I started. I've um, I'm a pharmacist of background, and I've worked within the medical industry back in Europe and doing clinical trials. Uh, in Denmark and in, in Europe. It was difficult to break into the Australian pharmaceutical industry, um, but I got a job as a project manager for an organisation that <clears throat> develops professional learning for um, GPs, so doctors, general practitioners. Uh, I worked there for eight years and then um, there were budget cuts one and a half year, years ago and my role at that time was made redundant and now I am working as a, um, a project manager within the New South Wales uh, Department of Education. So it's, um, it's developing professional learning for teachers in New South Wales. So that's very exciting and I, I really enjoy my new role and working with you know education and teaching so um yeah so full-time work so that's us that's us and why we are here in australia that was a long long story if you're still here i'm in, well, i'm impressed and thank you so much for for being here if you uh it's the first time here i hope you enjoyed and i hope of course hope you enjoyed as well if you've been here before um, I have had a ball talking about 
yarn and talk and just being reminded of our first weeks here, which was um, an experience. I think I cried the first two weeks. It's massive. It's massive. <laughs> Uh, but we love it here. We love it here. So it's it's all it's all good. So um, if you like it, please subscribe, subscribe, thumbs up, leave a comment on your favorite summer knits. I'm open for inspiration. Click the little bell so you get a notification when there is a new short video from me. Uh, well, until next time, happy knitting and see you then. Bye.